Okay. Thank you all for coming once again. We are here today to talk about the guy in the corner office, right? The Rook. Um, and his power on a chess game and his relevance and sort of uh, look at a bunch of different positions. Some of them are more extended and complex and strategic. Most of them are kind of keeping in, in um, line with last week's lecture. Many of them are simple and tactical, right? Trying to give you all things that are easily understood that come to a point fairly quickly. Welcome, Dan. Dan, can you hear? All right, well, I can't hear you, so we'll hope that that worked out, but um, okay. Uh, yeah, so as I was saying, right, trying to, trying to look at what this guy's good at. So this first position is, is very simple, and uh, I just wanted to talk about it as sort of uh, an introduction to demonstrating why the Rook is so incredibly powerful. Right, um, all of you are probably aware of the breakdown of the, the relative value of the pieces, but just for a second, I'd like to go through it. Right, so when we first learn to count material, to count up pieces and who's got more and who's got less when we play chess, we learn that the pawn is one point, that the bishops and knights are each worth three points, right? They are roughly the same in value. The rook is five, the queen is nine, okay? And the king in power, you could say, is around a four, but of course, it's complicated by the fact that the king is the entire game, and if you lose him, it's over. So, um, you know, that, that value is a little bit strange, but generally one, three, five, and nine. And a lot of the time, what I used to do with my beginner students in their first lesson is I would just take them through the pieces on an empty board, and we would kind of just talk about the relative strengths and weaknesses of the pieces and, and why, why are these values what they are? And what I would say is in trying to understand these values, the first thing you understand, understand is that the, the players who have arrived at these things, the, the theoreticians who sort of eventually uh, wrote these numbers down, were looking at the pieces with regards to the end game. Right? If you want to best understand a, a piece's value and its power, you have to look at it in the end game. Because in the end game, you can see the piece without all of the other complicating factors that happen in an opening and middle game. Right? It's very difficult to evaluate the relative value of a piece when there's a checkmate in one on the board that kind of makes that piece irrelevant. Right? So, um, so towards that end, right, and something we're going to look at in a later lecture, actually, probably, uh, I think probably either next week or, or the last lecture, is learning how incredibly fluid and not concrete these number values are, right? This five is meaningless in certain positions, right? <clears throat> but we're not going to look at that so much here today, right? I just want to look at things in a pure form and kind of, you know, learn some fundamentals. Okay, so long preamble over with. Why is the Rook so good? Well, I would argue that the reason why the Rook is worth more than either a Bishop or a Knight comes directly from his ability to control an entire line. A Bishop controls an entire diagonal, but with a Bishop, of course, you have this major weakness that, um, that, make sure I can actually touch the screen here. <laughs> okay, with a bishop, right, you have this problem that the line is porous. Okay, you only control the light squares or you only control the dark squares. And so pieces can very easily Right, move on the dark squares around you, and suddenly you don't look nearly so impressive. But with the rook, you have this ability to just cut things off. And nowhere is this seen more dramatically than in playing against the king, right? So in this position, we have black to play. Black has, you know, perhaps just captured one of light's last pieces or something like this, right? And we enter into this race 
where white wants to try and promote this pawn and make a queen and black wants to prevent that from happening. What's most likely in situations like this is that you're gonna end up with a draw. The rook will end up having to sacrifice himself for the pawn and the king will take, and that'll be that. You'll have king on king, which of course, um, you have no mating material, so the game is over. But in this position, black has a really nifty move, which is to play rook to b4. And in cutting off the king, right, in demonstrating this ability to hold the entire rank this way, we can see the power of the rook because this may not look like anything to some of you, right? But if the king now tries to just tempo, right, tries to just move around, okay? Well, what we've gained is now I have time, every tempo move that you make, I have time to bring my king up, right? And as I come around, I'm getting closer and closer and closer to being able to catch the pawn and defend it with my king so that I don't have to sacrifice with the rook. But that's not the interesting part, right? What's interesting, of course, is, well, okay, what if I don't tempo and I just make a run for it? Okay. Does anyone see what black should play here? Um, well, the rook can go to b6, or actually to b7, I guess. Rook to uh, b6 is right, Andrew. Your your instincts were better than your your logical <laughs> brain. Right? Shift from the hip. Yeah. Yes. Rook to b6 is the best move because now you notice that one tempo of cutting the king off and separating him from his buddy a little bit more means that now the king, unlike before, right, if we just attacked right away, I just want to make sure we don't miss this, right? If we just attacked right away, king to f4, and I'm continuing to make progress, right? But spending that little in-between move to separate them means now king to g4 or king to f4 no longer does anything. And so the only move is to play rook to g7, at which point rooks belong behind the pass pawn. Mm -hmm. And it's over. Okay, so just a little simple introduction, right? This idea of cutting the king off from the play, either for a checkmate threat, which we're actually going to look at in just a moment, or right, more comp on a more complex level, cutting him strategically away from the relevant action. Right? I'm going to relegate him to this side of the board, and then what I really want to do is going to happen over here where he has no influence. Okay? So, um, perhaps even simpler, right? I'll, I'll go through this one reasonably quickly, but I felt that I had to uh, take a pit stop here. Right? One of the first things that I teach my beginner players, and Dan, you're still here, so hopefully you can hear this because I was thinking of you when I put this in here. Um, is just learning how to create a mating net and checkmate, right? And the ladder checkmate, as this is called, is a really simple way of understanding that principle, right? Basically, um, I'm not going to quiz anybody on this. I don't think it's, you know. <laughs> but the idea here is very simple, right? The rooks march in a kind of alternating fashion, okay? Cutting off lines from the king one at a time. Notice that the back rook is very important to prevent the king from coming back down, right? We don't want to overcomplicate things here, okay? So the reason we call it the ladder checkmate is because, you know, you want to think of it as I teach the kindergartners. Um, you want to think of it as always, you know, your lower hand should be the next one to climb the rump, okay? And when the king inevitably interferes, well, we just switch to the other side of the ladder and keep going, okay? So, right, we can see that this whole thing works like clockwork. Now, the only thing I will say here that's worth noting, um, at this moment, I always like to note one little uh, neat uh, complication here, which is you can certainly do this the workmanlike way. And the workmanlike way is to kind of, like I was showing before, switch sides, and now the king is too slow, and we right, achieve checkmate. But if you want to win with style, here, there's another really nice little finesse, which is we can actually bring this rook up next to his brother. And you notice now that black is in Zugzwang, um, which if you ask my fifth graders is the Zweistug, the, the German thing that you say. <laughs> um, Zugzwang is essentially a principle in an end game in which 
you wish it was the other guy's turn. Those Germans have a word for everything. <laughs> right. Um, black, if black could just pass here, it would not yet be checkmate, right? Because anything like rook to a8, we could take here, or rook to b8, we could take the rook, right? But because you are not allowed to pass turn in chess, the game is fundamentally over. Black has to step away to the only legal square, and we're now free to pick our own, right, favorite weapon, either rook to b8 or rook to a8, or both checkmate. So that's just a nice little thing there. Um, and some, you know, this can come up in much more complicated positions where this little losing a move thing, as we call it, is, um, is the critical way to move forward. Okay. Okay. So the rooks control lines, right? They don't have the color weaknesses of bishops and they don't have the speed weaknesses of knights, right? Knights take an awful lot more time to cross the board than a rook does. So this is the reason why they're fundamentally better than either of the minor pieces. Also, actually let me throw this in here. Uh, a bishop or a knight alone cannot achieve checkmate. Okay, now I will not get into that because I've got a full enough lecture as it is, but essentially if you have king and single knight or king and single bishop, the game is over. It is a draw, okay? Assuming no other material is on the board. So this is another major reason why the rook is so much better, right? You can still win the game if you have only king and rook. Okay, so rooks are pretty important. That's the point, right? Don't underestimate them. And they get, they get better as the game goes on because since rooks are so good in the end game, the more trades that happen and the more the board empties out, the stronger they're going to get, okay? Yet, year after year, time after time, I still continue to see games that open like this, okay? Where white will play, you know, d4, e3, okay? And then something like knight c3. So this doesn't seem to do any harm, right? This seems like a reasonably innocuous sort of move to play. But the issue is that white has already demonstrated a lack of interest in his rooks. And, you know, when you talk to students about this, uh, this will become clearer as I show you what white should have played. But when you talk to people about this, very often they say, well, yeah, I'm just trying to get my pieces out. I mean, I'll worry about my rooks later. Well, one of the things that you discover when you start playing enough chess and having somebody <laughs> criticize your games enough is that often later never actually materializes, right? I keep meaning to get around to that. I keep meaning to get my rooks involved, but somehow it just never quite happened. So much better in this position... Well, go ahead. Anybody? What's, what's a better opening move to make? But you have to be thinking about your rooks, of course. I don't want just something you think is reasonable. How can we try and create an open line? A bishop or a knight move, right? A king, okay, can we king be more specific? Uh, maybe knight, knight to f3? I mean, knight to f3 is fine, but... I still don't see what this has to do with your rooks. You see what I mean? Okay. Right? It's not that it's an unreasonable move, but we're looking for something. Let me, let me be more specific. I want to be thinking about this rook's future. I want to start investing because someday this rook's going to need to go to college and I need to get the funds together now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is good. This is fine. Because it means I'm teaching to the right level. Right? The best move here, arguably, certainly the best move towards the point I'm trying to make. Ah, rook to a4. Oh, uh, pawn to a4. Bill had suggested. Okay, thank you, Bill. Took me a second to catch that in the chat. Yeah, so, okay. So this is, this is not unreasonable, right? And we'll look at ideas like this. Um, this is the sort of bloom where you're planted approach, right? Why do I need to move my rook anywhere? Let me try and just make something happen where he is. Okay, and this is not bad, right? Okay. This actually can be quite powerful at times, but I don't think that it's particularly great here. Um, and, and the main reason why is because I want to try, try and create an open file, okay? Now, I want to be very clear here. We're going to lay down some theory. An open file 
Now, first of all, the files are the ones that run from me to you, right? They're the ones marked with letters. This is the A file, this is the B file, this is the C file, D file, E file, etc. Okay, the ones that run from left to right are called the ranks. Okay, rank and file. Okay, perhaps we've heard this before in referring to the military. Okay, so files. When I talk about an open file, the definition of an open file is a file that is free of pawns. We do not care how many pieces, knights, bishops, rooks, queen, how many pieces are cluttering up the place. It doesn't matter. Why do we make this distinction between pieces, which have nothing to do with whether or not a file is open, and pawns, which are the defining characteristics? Why are the pawns so much more important when judging an open file? Because you don't care so much about taking pawns, really, and they tend to just be butting heads, uh, <laughs> typically. <laughs> so, okay. like, pieces are good targets if they're there, I would imagine, okay. and, and are more mobile as well if they're yours. I like it. I like it. And it shows my, uh, my general student's typical disdain for pawns, um, which <laughs> I always am amused by. But actually, I will say that a lot of the games, even at my level, right, even at the 1900-2000 level, which, you know, I am, I am uh, a pipsqueak compared to the world of professional chess, often comes down to putting a lot of pressure on a single pawn right, and making the opponent's position orient around that, that weakness. So it's not so much that. It actually, what, the second part that you said, I'll actually just, just power forward here. Andrew, the second part of what you said was actually the more relevant point, which is that pawns tend to spend so much of the game just butting heads, right? In a previous lecture, I talked about this ram structure, right? where the name literally comes from that act of rams butting heads, right? If I can clear, okay, giving the game away here, if I can clear the pawns from a file, my mobility will be more or less assured, right? Yes, the pieces are better targets, that's part of it, but the other thing about pieces is that they much more easily move off the file, right? If I need my bishop out of the way, I can do it with a a moment, right? A mere move and it's over. The knight's the same. In fact, the knights have to move off the file just to move at all, right? If you've got a knight parked on C3, he's got to go someplace and it's going to be out of my way, okay? But the pawns, right? If you look at this move like pawn to A4, for example, the only way I'm going to get more mobility out of the rook here is either to keep pushing this pawn as far as possible, right? Or try and, you know, lift the rook and transfer to a different file. Okay, both of which are fine, but it's slower. So the key move here, as I kind of showed a moment ago, right, C4, and now I've got tension. Now I've got an opportunity here, which gives me the chance later to play something like knight to C3. By the way, E3 was also probably a little early, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't mind having an opportunity to move this bishop out first. But knight to C3, bishop D2, and the rook can come to C1. And just like that, right, after he captures or I do, I'm going to be able to reach this C7 pawn and get into my opponent's camp, right? I've got pressure. The rook is involved in the game. Again, it may not seem like much, but this is the kind of thing we're looking for, right? Now, just a quick mirror image here before we move on, staying mindful of the time. Okay. Um, Right, black often makes the same kind of mistake in these positions, right, these queen spawn positions, by playing something like knight to c6. Okay, now, if you go through the history of chess, you can find plenty of grandmasters that have, like, given this a shot before, right? I mean, they've tried it. But in general, it's, it's breaking chess principles to do something like this. Because if we look at this position, okay, Black's pawn chain is heading towards the queen side, right? We're pointing in this direction. We've got this nice stable setup. I would like to keep this together if I can. We also note that um, white has pretty good control over this e5 square, right? Clearing up the clutter a little bit. Okay, so it's not going to be so easy for me to play this pawn break anyway. Okay, so it makes sense to try and preserve this 
as an option, right? I can put pressure on the center. I can try and take that over. We've looked at that in some other lectures as well. Okay, and then the knight can come in behind. And best of all, if I do all of this, suddenly I have plans available like bishop d7 and rook c8, and there's my rook, right? That's where the rook can get involved. Okay, so even at the very beginning of the game, you should be thinking about and looking for how you're going to get your rooks involved beyond the opening, right? Not just, as so many of my students do, moving them to the center, but, you know, if you think about this position for a second, if you just try and visualize, like, a rook here, right, pointing at your e6 pawn, unless you're planning on moving that thing, that rook isn't doing anything, right? That is not an effective development. Just because he's in the middle doesn't mean he's active. Okay. Great. We get a chance to get the audience involved a little bit here. So I have some very simple puzzles just looking for um, best ways to activate our rooks. Right, and um, yeah, so this one is white to play. And they're all one move, two moves tops, right? Nothing too difficult to understand. But what should white play here? Would you prefer that we jump in or raise hands? Or um, that's an excellent point. So play? if you, yeah, that's a good point, Andrew. All right, so listen, if you go, to the participants button. Hopefully we can find this, okay? If you go to the participants button, you should be able to, right, find an option um, to raise your hand, right? Um, and if you can't figure that out, I'll do my best to keep you involved, but... Um, it's under the list of participants on the right. Um, when you mouse over the thing and put participants. Andrew, you're a better explainer than I am. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Great. There it is. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Rob, do you want to participate or are you just demonstrating that you know how? Well, I'll, <clears throat> I just partly to demonstrate and then um, I'll, I'll just say something. Please. Um, so, <laughs> they, if you're moving a rook, you could move the rook from E1 to A1. Rook to A1 is exactly right. Thank you, Rob. You're I'll right. just say something. Happens okay. to be the correct answer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you. right? So this is interesting, right? Because we've got, we've got two open files, okay? We've got two open files. So, you know, a lot of the time when we're playing chess, we might think, well, I've done my job. I put my rook on an open file, right? But the rook's presence on the open file isn't going to be worth much unless you have an opportunity to do something with it, right? Something else I've said in a previous lecture is, a weakness is only a weakness if it can be exploited, right? A weakness is only a weakness if you can hit it, if you can punish him for it, if you can do something with it, right? Otherwise, it ceases to, ceases to be relevant. So the rook coming to, you know, as many people try to e6, right, really isn't that great, right? King f7, okay, making sure that you are not getting any further. Notice I control all these squares. Rook to d6, king to e7. Now the rook's basically trapped, right? I hope you like staying there because it's going to be a little bit hard to get out, right? You might have to, you know, temporarily sack a pawn or something to try and make sure your rook gets alive again. Whereas after Rob's move, okay, rook to a1, this is basically unstoppable. Right? Or rook to a8 might also be possible, right? But rook to a7 and the lax pieces are a little bit too tied up. Notice this rook seems active, right? Oh, I got him to an open file, but black is having the same problem, right? This king is actually incredibly useful on g2. Um, a lot of my students here actually don't even move the rook when I give them this puzzle. They play something like king to f2, right? And now you're just really ruining your own your own life, right? I mean, suddenly this rook is a monster and it's uh, really difficult to control it. Okay, so yeah, rook to a1, very nice. Let's move, moving right along. Okay, what about this, uh, what about this position? Again, white to play. And if you can figure out how to raise your hand, great. I'd prefer that, but you know, I don't wanna keep people from participating. White to play.
surely we could suggest something. Don't be afraid to be wrong. Yes, Andrew? All right. I feel like the answer is rook to d1, from a1 to d1. There we go. Rook, to, rook a to d1. Yeah. And why well, is that? Well, because then you are, you know, supporting that uh, your, your other rook and you're able to, you know, launch an attack on theirs. But the, the reason I'm hesitant about it is it feels like in this situation, you don't want to just get involved in a trade of all of your rooks. Um, yeah. I guess as long as you're first to make the attack, then, uh, yeah, I guess you can make both attacks on one. He can't. He can only make one attack. So I guess yeah. you come out ahead either way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. The problem with something like Rook to E2, right. Um, and, and like you said, thinking, oh, I'm going to decline to um, decline to exchange. Right. Like that's good. Is that now maybe I can play, I think here probably best is something like uh, maybe, maybe King to F8 first, right. To make sure I don't get back ranked. But at some point, I, I would like to play rook to d7, right, and double my rooks. And I don't think white has anything. Yeah, in fact, yeah, I think here, basically, there's white's advantage is, you know, practically nothing, right? And, of course, you can see in such a symmetrical position, it's going to be hard for anything interesting to happen, right? This is, this is probably a draw unless someone makes a mistake. Of course, below a certain level, I mean, I would, I would play on in this position. Let's be clear, right? I would, not, I would not offer a draw. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I would be playing knowing that, all right, unless this guy screws up, I don't know how I'm going to win this thing. You know, and, you know, I maybe even have a liability here that this pawn is um, on H5 is overextended, right? So your move is absolutely correct. Rook A to D1, right? Um, allowing the exchange of one pair of rooks, but as a result getting to own the file, right? Getting to own the file. And we'll talk about what we're gonna do with that file uh, in another couple of positions here. But thank you, that was great. Um, Bill or Rob, did you guys have questions or I assume you were just trying to jump in, but I wasn't sure. Okay. No, well, I mean, my, you answered my question because my, my response was, what about the rook from D2 to E2? And right, you right, answered just right. as, just as I was about to say that you answered it. So thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Just making sure. Yeah. Just making sure. Okay, great. So um, now we've we've sort of done a little bit of of puzzle solving here in terms of you know stealing um, getting uh, files open. Right. We're actually going to look at some more complex examples down the line if I have time. If I don't talk too slowly, um, but well. Actually, you know what? Here, just take a look at this. White to play here. I shouldn't have to intro this so much. Bill, you want to take a shot of this? I know you were you were jumping on the last one. What should what should White play here? Keep in mind that it is related to today's themes. Well, if I play, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. If I play uh, rook to d5, at least I threaten your pawn. I'm guarded my rook, and uh, if you don't do anything. Uh, uh, then I can slide the other rook in, one possibility. Rook to d5, rook to d5. Interesting. It's not, it's not the move I was looking for, but let me think for a second. Because I don't know that it's so... I don't know that it's so bad either. I mean, taking, right, ta taking is what I'm tempted to do, but I think taking is probably bad, right? Because I would give you a passed pawn, right? We'll talk about passed pawns maybe another day, but essentially a passed pawn is one that is past all of the pawns that could defend it. You'll notice this is a little bit similar to open files, right? That when I'm talking about open files and I'm talking about passed pawns, I'm only ever talking about pawn structure, right? It doesn't matter where the pieces are when we say passed pawn. Because for example, this queen, right? You're like, what are you talking about? This queen could totally stop it, right? But the queen is not a pawn and therefore it's a passed pawn, right? So I probably don't want to do that. I think that's probably good. Um, but maybe, oh, maybe that is best. Okay, maybe that is best. I was also looking at maybe just, you know, something like this. And I think this is probably fine. Um, although maybe, yeah, maybe I end up having to exchange everything, right? There is, however, I think a more powerful move to take over, in the, over the file, right? That gets more of an advantage. 
I guess is what I would say, right? That probably after rook d5, rook d5, pawn d5, and yeah, you're noticing, right, these little arrows here, which I hate. They give the game away. But this really nice move here of um, c4 is really beautiful. Purely, this is purely about just preventing white from being able to play c4 himself and guard his pawn, right? And so after something like this, now, okay, I've got a pass pawn, but it's also a little bit weak, right? I'm going to have to make sure that it doesn't drop. That would really stink. And, you know, the knight's going to come to d6 and be a nice blockader. Okay, so maybe that's a more full explanation. So we have something more aggressive that lets us, um, lets us try and take over the file. What else could we try? Think about who, think of, you know what? Here, let me teach this a little more. Going back to our previous example, right? Notice how in attacking here, black was trying to somehow disrupt the rook, right? If I could successfully disrupt this rook even a little bit, right? I was going to sort of knock white off balance and prevent him from taking the file before I do. And the issue with playing rook a to d1 is it pretty much forces either exchanging, which gives me the file, right? Yay. Or moving off, right? Which also gives me the file, <laughs> right? Okay. So if you can think about that, I think it might make it clearer what the answer is to this next one. Yeah, Chip. Oh, uh, bishop to g5, perhaps? Nice move, Chip. Yeah. Excellent. Bishop to g5. Okay. Just saying, hey, uh, where are you going with that guy? <laughs> right, very simple. Okay. Um, after this, they're followed in the game, right? Um, rook to d6. Okay, just logical. I'm not going to move off the file entirely. But now, because the rooks are disconnected, Right, white was able to take over because of Tempe, right? Exchange rooks, the queen is now a target. Okay, rook to d1, queen to e6, and now there's your rook to d5 without opposition, right? And we have the pressure, and we have everything that we had before, except that now there's no pawn weakness, right, on our part, and we wholly own the file. This bishop is still preventing any kind of play to d8 okay and we can follow it up i think i don't think i recorded any more of this game right but we could follow this up very simply with probably you know queen d3 or or queen d2 even maybe making sure the bishop stays uh protected okay and and this gives us even more opportunity maybe uh you know what is really nasty here these kind of threats something like bishop h6 can become really scary because now any penetration to the back rank is going to be a checkmate threat. Right, so that might be how I would try and follow this up. Okay, that's very nice. Thank you, Chip. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? How am I doing? 111? Okay. So um, a, a more dramatic example. This one I will not be, uh, you know, working a quiz on just to show you. This is one of my students' recent games. Um, he's around 1100, right? And uh, to be honest, right, I'm not, I'm not super concerned with the way this game began, but more just there was a very interesting position here that happened right, uh, right around here <laughs> where you notice at this stage in the game, okay, so Black has managed to escape with some material, right, after some sloppiness by white. He's diffused white's attack. There was some mating threats over here that he managed to get rid of. Okay. But now he's got this problem of, you know, saving his knight. And what's really, really beautiful here that I just wanted to share is, of course, in the game, right, my student, uh, very typical for his level, um, saved his knight by moving it back to g6. Right. Very, um, understandable and, and not even necessarily bad, but it's really cool to notice here that actually, right, we notice how my student has completely neglected rook play through the entirety of the game so far, right? The most powerful and most accurate move for black to play here is the really cool F6 with the idea that if you try and take my knight, okay, suddenly, I'm in position to uh, rip the file open, 
okay? And we notice that there's already an immediate threat of, you know, winning the queen or pinning the knight to the king, right? Um, and there would follow after something like g3, right? Notice there's no taking here, right? Okay, after something like g3, does anybody see how black can get his piece back immediately? Notice that we have this nasty pin on the king. Dan. Sorry, Dan, couldn't hear you. Oh, you're muted. Hang on. Move the pawn to e4. Yes, sir. Nice job. Very good. Yeah, right? pressure on the pinned piece. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right. And we win material right back. And at this point, I hope it's clear. I mean, you know, if you're looking at something like this, as soon as you get the piece back, you can stop trying to calculate, right? You don't have to know whether this is good enough to play anymore. If you can see that in just a few moves, you're getting all your material back, and now your rooks have a way to flood into the game via this F file, right? I mean, that's all you need, okay? So I just thought this was really cool and instructive. And, you know, sometimes even when the position seems really simple, just save your piece, like, what are you doing? You know, um, be traditional, right? These active moves of trying to create open lanes for yourself are, uh, are the most relevant thing. Okay, <clears throat> um, great. So we've talked about why we why rooks are so good. We've talked about creating open files. We've talked even a little bit about stealing open files. Okay, now come a series of examples on, okay, John, I've got the file, but now what, right? As you told me quite wisely at the beginning, Right? A weakness is only a weakness if you can do something with it. Well, an open file isn't worth that much unless you can use it to penetrate. Okay? You have to be able to get into your opponent's position and cause problems. And the most common theme, the most common strategic point for being able to do this is to bring your rook or rooks, right? ideally even better, and we'll look at those examples too, to the seventh rank. Now, of course, when we say the seventh rank, right, we are also talking about the second rank because it's the seventh if you're playing black, okay? But I think most of the examples that I have for today are, are um, with white to play for no particular reason. Okay, so why, why is the rook on the seventh so good? Maybe we've heard this before, right? Somewhere we've read it. Why is this the magic number for where the rook belongs? What's so great about having a rook on the seventh? Anybody? Well, it certainly confines the king. It keeps the king kind of out of the game to a certain extent. Absolutely, right? It can confine the king, right? So a lot of the examples we're going to look at coming up are going to be very simply just checkmate threats, right? We create a lot of middle game and end game checkmate opportunities by the fact that the king suddenly has no ability to escape, right? There's no kind of, you know, a lot of the time... A lot of the time when you sacrifice against a king, right, his, his wiggle out will look like f7, e8, you know, d8, c7, right? Well, when you have the entirety of the seventh rank taken out of commission, right, it, that means he's limited only to this. And this is often crowded with pieces. So it's not going to work so well. What else? There's at least one more reason. It's the, uh, the root of all of the pawn chains. So you can just start gobbling up pawns. Bingo. Bingo, right? It's very, very valuable pawns. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, thank you. If you learn nothing else from me, <laughs> if you learn nothing else. Um, yes, okay. Yeah, this is very often when I play practice games with my students, I actually, um, I don't play practice games with my students very often because I, I just don't, you know, I'm, I'm unclear on the level of instructive power. But when I do, I often try and just go up a pawn and grind them down because... I am attempting to uh, teach them a healthy respect for, <laughs> you know, why it's not good to drop a pawn and then not worry about it. Um, yeah, okay, so these are the two reasons, right? There's lots and lots of popcorn to munch on, and we greatly restrict both the king, and especially if we have both rooks on there, sometimes you're restricting everybody, right? Sometimes you're on Fifth Avenue standing in the center intersection on 50th Street, right? I mean, you're just preventing anybody from doing anything. Okay, um, Okay. so, uh, you know, an instructive position here, right? White has pressure on C7. Um, there's plenty of things that black could do in sort of a desperate 
way to try and, but I think let's, let's look just at the most logical and simple plan. He plays rook to c8 to defend. Um, I guess it's worth mentioning for a moment here that uh, c5 might look like a save, right? But hopefully we all know our obscure French chess terms. What is it that white now plays? Uh, it's uh, en passant. Is that what yes, it is? exactly. Yeah. En passant, right? En passant. Okay. And uh, whoops. <laughs> okay. So anybody who uh, does not know about that, I won't be tackling en passant today, but I thought I should mention it, right? One of the weirdest moves in chess by far, and the one most likely to create an argument in a bar. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, so rook to c8 is, is the only logical move. And now, of course, in the end game, we should always be trying to use all of our pieces. So king to d5 makes a lot of sense. Okay, something like h6. Um, there's really, the, the only purpose to this move is just to, you know, save time. Um, notice, actually, you know, one of the other things here, you want to talk about the power of this rook, right? The king is entirely pinned down. You might have been thinking about, well, why, you know, why don't I come over here to drive him out? Well, the problem is that if you do that, the second you go to f8, I come over here and I eat this, right? And if you keep trying to come over here to somehow <clears throat> extract your rook, well, then I'm just going to come here and eat this, and right, these guys are going to kill you, okay? So this maybe makes a little more sense why h6 is played, right? At least trying to make it so if the king moves, we don't immediately drop material. But now, king to c6, right, um, king to f8, and now white is completely unafraid of exchanging because with a symmetrical structure over here, okay, black has no um, pass pawn, right? There's nothing threatening to queen over here, okay? We have no fears of black just, you know, kamikaze chucking his pawns at us and, and having anything bad happen. So we exchange, okay? And even though um, it may not seem like much because, of course, we are still equal in material, the better king is, is decisive, right? Better because I am so much closer to your targets and you have a very long walk to get to mine, right? So you can just see a sample line here. Um, this very nice move, a5, um, is something that I like as a nice detail because, of course, if black takes, you notice that we control the runway, okay? And there's nothing to stop. Um, a very fast promotion to a queen, at which point I hope you can all find your way. Okay, so um, very simple, right? Very dull, very much the kind of thing, Andrew, that I would, that I would do to you um, <laughs> to try and make my point, right? That um, this is like the worst, you know? It's, it's bad enough to lose at chess, but to lose in these kind of, yeah, and then for the last 20 moves of the game, I basically could do nothing, right? I was just completely positionally dominated. Um, it's really lousy, and, and one of the reasons why it's good to learn these principles so you can take advantage and prevent your opponent from taking advantage. All right. Uh, look at some things. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry? Uh, this, uh, it's a little bit of a random question, but just in terms of Whoops. promoting, is there ever any reason to not promote to a queen? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We're going off book here. Hang on. Okay. Yes. Um, I can handle that quickly. Normally, I would say I'll wait till the end, right? But... Let me just show you one very instructive example. Okay, um, this is uh, very simple, right? Um, and of course, you might think a little contrived, but um, I've certainly had my students do things like this. Okay, so just, just as one instructive example, um, <clears throat> you will notice that I hold the G6 square. And if I promote to a queen in this position, funnily enough, that's a stalemate. Uh, right? Yeah. So what is typically, right, of course, uh, if you remember earlier, I said a knight and a bishop will both be a draw as well, because even though they're not a stalemate, they're not enough to win. And mm -hmm. so the only choice here is to promote to a rook. Right? Uh, this is your uh, only hope of winning. Um, now, of course, you could also, in this position, right, you might think, well, okay, but I could also you know, maybe just work my way around, right? And try and get a queen anyway. Uh -huh. And that's fine, right? In this specific position, that is, that is true. But um, there are other positions um, like this, right? Where sometimes the only possible thing is to promote right now, 
Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have time. Um, you don't have time to wait to wait another turn. And there are other positions. I won't try and create one immediately, but there are other positions, Kenny, where um, promoting to a knight will mate on the spot. Um, yeah. Actually, you know, here's another one. I can't help myself. <laughs> uh, it's a fun question. Um, just one more. This would be another one for you. Uh, now, this one won't win, but um, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe if I have a rook in reserve, you know, or something. But you might think uh, this would be another just simple opportunity, right? Where, mm -hmm. oops, there we go. Right, where promoting to a knight wins the queen. Yeah, okay. You see what I mean? Right, so there's there's lots of reasons. Like, cool. lots of reasons why it might be more accurate to what we call under-promote. Right. But those are just a couple of quick ones. Um, also, style points. You know, style points are very important in chess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you can win with the rook and you really want to be a jerk to the guy, you know, promote to the rook. Yeah. Okay. Two rooks on the seventh. Black's going to have some fun here. Um, this is not too hard to find, but it is, you know, hopefully a new pattern for a lot of you. What can Black play here? But keep in mind, you have to have the whole sequence or uh, I don't want to hear from you. So you have to think it out ahead of time. Okay. Rook to G2. Rook to G2. Okay. King to H1. Yeah. And uh, rook takes pawn. Okay. King back to G1. And uh, rook to G2. Rook Which rook? The, the, the one on G. There we go. Right. Rook D, rook D to G2, we would say. Yes. Thank you, Chip. Excellent. Right. So just demonstrating again the power of the rooks, right? Notice, um, I just want to say briefly, this is what I was talking about before that we've restricted the king, of course, that's why it's gonna be checkmate, but look at how the rooks are also just restricted as well, right? That I want so badly, and very often you will get someone to blunder when it's white to play in such positions, right? And they'll play rook to f2, and you know, just, I mean, they're missing something obvious, but it's also out of desperation, right? And of course you just snap the rook off and they go, oh, right, <laughs> right, yeah, you know? So two rooks on the seventh can be really devastating. Okay, um, another, oops. <laughs> yes. yes, very good, Dan. Um, okay, uh, yeah, white to play in this position. This one's more of just a one mover, but it's gotta be the right move. Oh. Uh, H rook to H8. H, rook to H, eight. Uh, the departure effect got gotcha. you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Effect got gotcha, you, Kenny. That's right. So that, that may help you understand what the answer is, right? Ah, I just gave it away. Well, if you didn't see it, I'll still give you a chance at it. Sorry about that. An errant finger move. Anybody? Yeah, rook to uh, A7. Yeah, rook to a7. So, Kenny, here's where it relates to your idea. The reason this is winning is because you now notice I've got that threat now. Mm -hmm. Right? There's no king to c7. But the reason, of course, that it wins, because, of course, right, I can just play rook to g8, right? So what, right? Where's your idea coming from? Well, that's where the other rook comes into play. <laughs> this is still checkmate. Okay, so you can't, you can't defend both threats, right? If I try to play rook to c1 to defend against rook to a8, well, now we already know this, right? That's where rook to h8 comes in. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, harder example. Harder example now. We've got uh, three of these left. What should white play here? And again, challenge yourselves to try and see as far as you can, right, before, don't treat these, one of my least favorite things about solving tactics on the computer is it can get you in the habit of just kind of trying moves and waiting until the computer program says right or wrong, right? Really try and push yourselves to see, okay, well, then what? And then what, you know?
All right, Rob, I saw your hand first. Well, I mean, I'm looking at two different moves. One, the first one I saw was the rook on D7 to take the pawn on B7. Uh, okay. Or there's another move, the bishop that's on G2. The bishop on G2 could take the pawn on B7. Okay. But I haven't looked at, analyzed both, either of those, but one of, the, one of those might be good. <laughs> Rob, flying in the face of my advice. <laughs> <laughs> John, I know I heard what you said, but I'm just going to throw moves out there. Right. Uh, no, thank you, Rob. Thank you, please, um, for participating and, and being here every week. I really appreciate it. <laughs> please don't leave. Um, but no, I'm sorry. So, but let's, but let me, let me push you on this, Rob, um, before I let somebody else come in. Okay, there's a very immediate problem with rook takes b7 right away. And I want you to sit here and tell me what it is. What is black play now? Devastating. Oh, rook on e8 to e2, e1, and checkmate. Bingo, right? I He's guess. got this rook thing going on too, right? He's got this rook thing going on too. So we need more accuracy than that, right? We need more accuracy. Now, bishop to b7, uh, I'm just going to tell you, is not quite what we're looking for. Um, and I think my simplest explanation for that, other than, right, just, well, tactically, it doesn't work, right? Sorry, right? We have to look at it through analysis. But um, I think maybe one thing that you might remember is just you are cutting the rooks off from the file a little bit. And I don't, and I don't see another immediate check, right, after king to b8, which given that your opponent is threatening mate in one, Right, or at least uh, mating attacks. I guess maybe it's not mate in one. I have this this move, but right. I think the fact that we don't have a follow up is an issue. Make sense? Yes. But thank you very much, Andrew. Do you want to jump in? You were. I saw your hand. Um, you know, I was thinking the same thing. So. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. Let's give this another. Let's give this another thirty seconds, and then. Oh, Dan. By all means. You're muted. So I think the move is rook to c seven. Very nice. This is a nice little throw in, right? It doesn't seem like much. Okay, so first of all, obviously if we go here, the game is over. Okay, there's that pattern that we saw down here before, right? If the king gets too restricted, the rooks can just end the game all by themselves. But here's the key difference, right? After rook to b8, now, Rob, now, Andrew, we can take this pawn off with check. There's no rookie one coming to save you. Okay. So Dan, how far did you see this thing here? So I assume you saw this much, right? What about after rook to a8? Can you get an idea how to continue? Um, you can move one uh, rook but to a7, right? Rook to a7 check. King's only move now, right? This is double check, by the way. Not that it actually particularly matters here, but just so you notice, right? Somebody might think you could take the bishop off here, right, or something, right? But this is uh, now rook to, I'm sorry, king to b8. And now the finish. <laughs> uh, Keep in mind you have this bishop helping you. That's my hand. Right. Rook to a8. Rook to a8 is very nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was too busy looking at the other rook, how it's going to move. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Um, yeah, absolutely. Now, I think, hang on, there was one, maybe there was one thing here, right, of king to c6. Okay, but now, let me just look at this for half a second here. Um, check, check. Hmm. Yeah, okay, right. So now bishop h3, I think will do it, right? This, none of these things do anything. We just take them. Right, they're just uh, speed bumps. Okay, and after something like this, actually there's this same idea again. Right, slightly different because I'm not here, but that same pattern of the rook manages to get to the eighth and, and seal the game off. Okay, very, very good. Very, very good. So that, anyway, the, the point there is, you know, maybe not related so much to rooks, but to calculation, what a difference it makes to maneuver so that you can make that same capture with check. Right, and how that upsets all of Black's plans. Okay. We're getting down to the finish here. I'm aware of the time, so I'll, I'll try and keep things pushing here. 
just as, just to interject, I think this helps me so much because I lose so many games like that because I get excited and I take the piece. Like that's that's my I think that's maybe my biggest losing or my attitude or my emotional state is I get too excited and I jump the gun, pull the trigger too early. I don't count to ten and pause. I yeah. I, I lose so many games or I used to when I that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's incredibly common, incredibly common, you know, and, and honestly, I don't, I mean, you know, I, I coach such things, right? Well, remember to do this and look for that. But honestly, I don't know if there's any real effective solution to such problems, except to learn by long, painful, bitter experience. You know, you lose enough games that way. And boy, I have lost a lot of heartbreakers. You know, and you just start to become naturally more circumspect. But it takes it takes a really long time, you know, for that for that feeling of. But I'm gonna go get them. <laughs> well, I had like all these games where I say one more move in there and check, and then all of a sudden they do like the black moves, the rook down, and checkmates me, and I'm like, oh, because I yeah. I lose so much focus on the defense, and I'm so excited with my plan. Yeah. And so the 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 last move before I do the checkmate. I've got it. It's a constant. Yeah. It's, anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. And keep then the other the other piece of advice I'd say to that, of course, Rob, is is keep playing those players. You know, always try and seek out the players that beat you and that catch you because a lot of what leads to that attitude as well and leads to those problems, I find, is people playing a little bit too much with people that they beat all the time, right? And it's a natural thing, it's fun, you're happy about winning, but it teaches you to look at things superficially and lazily, you know, when the opponent is not pushing you to be your best because, you know, you, you win a lot, right? So the people who catch you and the, keep, the people who punish you, you have to kind of learn to seek those people out within reason. You don't want someone that you lose to 100% of the time, but, you know, 50% or even 60% you're losing, those people, that's the sweet spot, you know, somebody to, to measure yourself against. Okay. This one's, um, this one's the hardest one of the day. And then the, the, we're on the downhill slope. I got a couple of very quick things that I'll just show you and, and we'll wrap. Um, but this is, the, this is absolutely the hardest, uh, the hardest yeah. thing. So um, while, while people think here, I'll talk just a little. Uh, you know, black is not necessarily threatening anything immediate. Right? The, you know, the queen's there, but the knight's not exactly where he needs to be, right? He needs to maybe be on, um, on b4. Then you'd really be in trouble because he would be reaching into, right? The queen a2 and queen c2 would be the immediate threat. Um, but uh, there is quite a bit of defense. I think the key to getting this one right is thinking, A, about this idea that we looked at in the previous puzzle, right, of trying to take things with tempo, trying to keep things so that your opponent stays off balance the entire time. Okay, that's one. And two is, um, wow, I've forgotten two, that's weird. Oh, and, uh, and two would be being aware of your opponent's defensive capabilities, like seeing if you can figure out what your opponent's best defensive move would be and, um, and trying not to allow that. And that's as much as I'll give you. And we'll, we'll take a minute here because it is the last one of the day, really. Um, I'm sorry, you did say it is black to play. Is that right? It is white to play. White. Thank you. Let's not go down that road again. <laughs> white to play. Yeah, I'm sorry. What I, what I meant, Andrew, was like, we have to, threat. like we yeah. were talking about with Rob, right? We have to watch out for black's threats. Got it. But, um, but no, this is white to play. We're, taking, we're playing with the rooks today. What about rook takes pawn? So, I was hoping someone would do this, but as you know, when I say that, I'm often <laughs> <laughs> saying so because it's a mistake. Sure, no problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. That would have been my move too, so don't worry. <laughs> there it is. There it is. That's good. That's good, good community support. Um, yeah, so the problem with this move, um, as tempting as it is, is that it allows uh, actually queen to f8, 
right? Which is, um, so the queen, given the fact that we have this knight, I am more than happy to sacrifice the queen for two rooks here, right? So something like this that you might think, oh, I bagged the queen, right? Well, this is just, this is terrible, right? I mean, if you know, look at this, this guy's gonna eat you alive, right? Um, the nene is loose. Um, okay, so queen to f8 is, is a very good defensive move. And now, yeah, so maybe best play would be, okay, something like rook to e7, right? Knight to e2 going after this g-pawn. Um, and I think right after something like this, black has a lot of threats. You know, it's, it's no longer so clear. Let's put it that way. It seems very good for black because of the danger of this. And the fact that um, we're going to look at this actually in a second. Oh, I guess I do have one more example. I'll try and be brief here. But um, suffice to say, something I want to I want to make sure you see: if these rooks ever separate, it's very tempting, right, to say, "Well, why don't I come down here?" You know, if these rooks ever separate, you will find most of the time that the queen is going to double attack and win one of those rooks in about two moves. <laughs> You know, that it's, it's just almost any position, especially where the king is this exposed, right? There's this much open line available to the king. There is just no way that those rooks are going to survive if they don't use the buddy system. Okay, and we'll, we'll look at at least one of those quickly in a minute. So, okay, one more shot at this. I am mindful of people's time on a Saturday. What could we try instead of rook takes c7? There's something we have to throw in first, very similar to last time. It's not easy. Oh, Andrew. Um, so, well, what I was thinking was uh, the H rook to G7. Okay. All right, and now uh, he's H8, of course, in the right? Corner. Yeah. Yep, and so then now that uh, H rook down to H5. Well, or you might as well go H4, I guess. Yeah, to G4, to G4. Okay, G4. Let me see. Um, Let me see. Now I, yeah, I hadn't. I hadn't looked at this. Okay, so maybe. So then I think he brings his queen in to. Uh, something like this, maybe. To, yeah, um, and then um, and then <laughs> and then I was thinking. Uh, and, that, yeah. Yeah, but um. You weren't so I'm, sure after that, yeah. I wasn't so sure after that. Yeah. I, I was thinking you'd be able to bring that that uh, f rook over, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, unfortunately, this is a yeah. nasty, nasty threat, right? This is, yeah. um, but maybe, you know what, actually, hang on. So there is at least this. Oh, this yeah. is pretty yeah. cool, right? Trying to come here and defending against that. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. That's so what do I have? I didn't see that at first. Hmm. Hmm. You can right, well, in the interest of, oh, this is, okay, wow. Five, John? Sorry? Queen to h5 to defend. Yeah, I did, I did see that, but after queen to h5, I think, um, right, he's still here. Yeah. And I am, I mean, I know I said what I said about picking off the rooks, but I want to be sure I can do it, right? <laughs> I'm not, I don't see like an immediate. Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe white's doing well there. Apparently, apparently the best move here is knight to f3, which full credit to you, Andrew, like that's not so easy, right? You can see the idea. Okay, so this is one, and then uh, the the key here is if he steals the the rook. Now here's what I was talking about, right? Queen to g1, king yeah. either place doesn't matter. There's my winning of one of the rooks, and once I get one of them, it's right. You're a dead duck. Yeah, but that's pretty complex. I mean, that's you know, I it took me a second, and I I'm not sure. You know, I I would probably need quite a bit of time to find that. So that's good. That's not bad at all. All right, so moving, moving things along, though, the, the most precise idea here, I think, um, is something like, right, rook f to g7, king to f8, and now we take because, and what's the big difference? Well, this isn't with check, but now queen to f 8s prevented, there's a king there, and I have this mate threat. So it sort of comes with that same sense of you have to immediately respond, mm. right? If that makes sense. So, okay, so back to G8, so back to G7, so back to F8, 
and now I take on B7. <laughs> and back to G8, and back to G7, and back to F8, and now I take on A7. Yeah, but then the queen takes it, no? But then Absolutely. Then you now the queen it. takes it. The difference, is, the, queen. Yeah. the difference is in the earlier position, I was trading the queen for two rooks, and black was up a knight, and black had a bunch of pawns. In this position, I'm the one with the pawns, right? The rook is better than the knight, and um, I got to think, I mean, okay, so something like this, certainly, but I think even here, um, yeah, maybe, okay, so king to b2, we grab here. But now rook to a4, right? That pass pawn doesn't survive. And while, while this does probably take some skill to convert, I concede, you've got a lot of trouble here, right? The knight is just straight up not as good. You can always sacrifice the rook for the knight if you get a chance, right? You can't just leave it protected because my two pawns are going to be enough to win. And there are a lot of tactics, right? Like, look at knight to e2 seems reasonable, but whoops. You know, things like this can lead. So this, this should be completely winning for white, albeit we would have to sit there and figure it out. Okay, so that's, um, that kind of attack is called a mill or a windmill, right? Because you kind of go down and around and then down and around and down and around again, right? Um, these sorts of things can happen sometimes um, and they're always very, uh, very funny. You know, um, you just kind of sit there and as black, you feel very depressed. <laughs> You know, watching these rooks just kind of <laughs> eat everything on the seventh. Okay. The last thing I wanted to look at, and we'll be very quick, is that sometimes you don't have enough to checkmate, but you can use this same attacking idea of the rooks, right, to get a draw. Right? The king's not restricted enough to, um, to mate here, but as long as you make sure that you're always checking with the same rook, he can't ever escape either. And so even though right, black is threatening this immediate checkmate, right, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so it's just sort of a weapon to be aware of that sometimes even when it's not enough to actually win the game, you can force a draw. And a draw could be a good result, right? It's certainly a lot better than losing. Um, this was sort of what I was referencing here. Anybody want to quickly tell me why would it be such a rotten idea to say, oh, I can win a piece. This is not so easy. Um, it's a two move double attack. So we'll take one shot at this. Only one person gets to go. Yeah, Chip. I see it. Uh, queen to. Uh... Oh, sorry, Chip had, Chip had raised his hand. Oh, sorry. I'm here. Yeah. What do you got, Chip? Nope, oh, you're muted. Queen to c1. Oh, queen to c1, and then what? Uh, the king moves, and then, uh, oops, I, I, I meant to uh, <laughs> Dang it! Pick, pick up a rook on a diagonal, but I, I picked the wrong one. No, that's all right. All right, Kenny, what do you got? Hang on, sorry, let me get back there. <laughs> that was your voice, Kenny, right? Um, so queen to uh, c8, uh, oh. and then you. Oh wait, wait, wait. Yeah, no. sorry. Yeah. I okay. can save everybody. Okay, that's all right. In the interest of time, right? Queen to c6 is the first move, <clears throat> making sure that we get the king out where we need him. This is very hard, right? It's not not an easy one at all. Um, I just wanted to show you how you may not be able to see it, but sooner or later, separating your rooks will be a bad idea. And now, queen to c5. Got it. Right. But it all comes from, right, a lot, it's easy to think it's this rook that's the problem. It's not this rook that's the problem. It's the fact that the rooks aren't connected. That's the problem. Okay. Okay. Last, very last, my promise to God, last thing. I'll get you all out of here. Okay. Um, this is just one of my favorite dumb, interesting things in chess, okay, as a way to get the rook involved. Um, we look at the Rui Lopez. This, this kind of attack uh, exists actually in a number of different openings, but this is probably one of the most famous, and this is one that I used to play a lot. Um, 
So, of course, the Ruy Lopez, we talked about this before, is named after a 15th century Spanish monk, etc. White's idea is very simple, right? We're trying to undermine the knight, okay? But this is what I like. In these King Kassad Castle lines, black now has bishop g4, and after the quite obvious h3, okay, just trying to beg the question of the bishop, taking is a terrible move, okay? It just helps white develop and exchanges off one of your bishops, right? Um, moving away doesn't make a lot of sense because, I, you know, why did we come there in the first place? This move is very obvious. I don't, you know, I'm not sure why we did that if, if uh, we were prepared to retreat. So we do neither. And we play what is known as a fishing pole attack. Okay, with h4. I'm sorry, h5, excuse me. Right? So um, we won't look at all of the various complications that result from this. I just want to look at the very obvious example, which is, well, what happens if white takes my bishop, right? That seems bad. Okay, well, you'll notice that after we take back, we have achieved instantaneous open file, reaching all the way to the back of the theater, okay? And the queen is coming in. So, for example, right, I mean, White's honest best play might be to actually let us take the knight, as sad as that is, right, give back the material right away. But if you try and save it and play a move like knight to e5, suddenly queen to h4 threatens an immediate checkmate. And we will end with one final small puzzle. Let's say that White plays now logically uh, pawn to f4. Okay, this looks very logical. I'm trying to, you know, after queen to h1, be able to squeeze out on king to f2. What does black play now? So what does black play? Mm -hmm. What does black play now? And uh, Rob, I've heard from you a lot today, so forgive me. <laughs> Kenny, I've heard uh, from all uh, you a lot. Who am I kidding? But. I'm <laughs> uh, bishop to uh, f5. Uh, bishop c5, c5. I know what you're doing. You had the board flipped. Yeah. Uh, bishop to c5 is pretty good, but let's see. Bishop to c5 is, I think this is winning. Yeah, this is winning. Um, but I do, yeah, it's only, sorry, it's actually, it's winning, but you're, it's only winning if you find the original idea because I have now d4 to shut you out. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay, Rob. I'll give you the second time around. I'll let you have it. I, I mean, I got to move back. Hang on. Uh, Any I'm ideas? Just, well, I'm just thinking about your French move, the en passant move. Oh, okay. En passant lets that, me bring my knight home. Oh, okay. Right? And now, right, queen to h1 no longer works because I have this escape. And I'm hitting your queen, right? This is no good. This is sad okay. times. This is sad times. Okay. Uh, Chip? Uh, G6. Or G3, G3, but G3, yes. G3, yeah, G3. yeah, I know, no, you absolutely have it. I love, right, this is just absolutely ice water in the veins. Okay. Completely, uh, completely boring looking move that wins the game immediately. <laughs> right? Just, no. Right? Simply the word no as a move. Okay? I will not be letting you bring your king out, I will not be letting you go anywhere, okay? And queen to h1 is now <laughs> unstoppable. That would be very satisfying. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, I love this stuff, okay? Um, there's a whole lesson there. Maybe, maybe that's something we'll look at. I, I've been staying away from building a mating net because it is more complex, and I, you know, but um, it might be something we'll look at in one of these last two, right? But these kinds of moves sometimes not you know not uh rob to your point earlier not getting over excited right not playing the check first because it's check but just saying no 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 let me just make sure that there are no problems right well the, and the ampersand is like so so exciting and so right. out there and like I'd, I'd almost rather do that and lose than <laughs> yeah and get in an argument no. No. oh you didn't know i could do that yeah. wow <laughs> Um, Passant has a rich and storied history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I understand. I understand the temptation.